He flew over 100 combat missions during the Vietnam War. He worked as a test pilot, astronaut, commanding general of the Marine Expeditionary Force attached to the Operation Desert Thunder in Kuwait. Charles Bolden, 34 years of career with the, the uh, Marine Corps, included 14 years as a member of NASA's astronaut office. He traveled to the orbit four times, commanding two of the missions and two piloting, and piloting two others. Charles Bolden has several distinguished defense service medals, distinguished flying cross, air medal, NASA exceptional service medals, NASA space flight medals, and national space trophy to his credit. And he has also holds several honorary doctorate degrees from the numer numerous institutions of higher education. He was inducted into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame in the May 2006 and entered into the National Aviation Hall of Fame in the year 2017. He is a resident of the Potomac Institute and trustee of the Bank Inter Innovation Foundation. Today, Charles Bolden serves as the president and CEO of the Bolden Consulting Group and serves as the independent director of the Lord Corporation and Atlas Air Worldwide Holdings. Currently, he is serving as the United Space Science Envoy for Space. This is only the glimpse of his achievements. I welcome you, sir, for this program. I, I request our honorable chairman, vice chairman, secretary, to come over to the dais and do the felicitation to our today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Bolden. Thank you, sir. I also welcome Sita Farrell, Information Officer, Office of the Environment and Science, Department of State, Washington, D.C., to this program. I welcome you, madam. I request our chairman and other dignitaries to felicitate the madam. Specialist, U.S. Consulate, Chennai, to this program. I welcome you, sir. I request our vice chairman and the management to felicitate. Thank you, sir. I also welcome Sarah Grass, Political and Economic Officer, U.S. Consulate, Chennai, to this presentation program. I welcome you, madam.
थैंक यू वेरी मच सर आई टेक प्लेजर टू वेलकम अवर ऑनरेबल चेयरमैन गोकुला एजुकेशन फाउंडेशन डॉक्टर एम आर जयराम सर वही चेयरमैन श्री एम आर सीताराम सर सेक्रेटरी श्री एम आर रामया और ऑनरेबल ट्रस्टी श्री एम आर आनंद नाव सर द चीफ एग्जीक्यूटिव ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग मेडिकल फॉर दिस प्रेजेंटेशन आई ऑल्सो वेलकम ऑल द प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ दिस जी एफ इंस्टीट्यूशन हेड्स ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट्स इन्वाइटेड गेस्ट फैकल्टी स्टूडेंट्स प्रेस एंड मीडिया एंड ऑल द व्यूअर्स ऑफ दिस लाइव वीडियो स्ट्रीमिंग which will immensely benefit the students across the state of Karnataka and India at large once again i welcome one and all to this program thank you may i now request mr charles bolden to deliver the presentation to all our eager and enthusiastic audience Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with all of you. And um, normally, I would—I have two rules, and I'm going to tell you the rules, except don't pay any attention to them, okay? Because my normal two rules for an audience is: ask questions anytime you want, but they tell me you're going to have a period of time where you—you're going to all go online, and you're going to send questions in. Is that true? For the students, especially. So, so we'll kind of forego the, the questions until. Get to that particular time, but when we do get to the time for questions, we make a request. That's rule number two. There are no dumb questions, except the one you don't ask. You know, uh, I have a very limited time here with you, and what I'd like to do is is have an opportunity to respond to the questions uh, that may be on your mind, and I, and I think that'll be probably the most important thing that we get to do today is in, in that part of the interaction with all of you to try to help you. Let me talk a little bit about what I do or why I'm here. Um, in, in my bio, which was too long, uh, people talk about things that happened before most of you were born, so that doesn't count. Uh, but it was mentioned one thing, that I am the CEO and president of the Bolden Consulting Group. So for some of you who are still students, when you get to retirement, one of the things you can do is put yourself to work and you call yourself a corporation. So I'm a corporation of one person that, that tries to consult for people. So I'm here to consult for all of you today, and I come as what is called the Department of the U.S. Department of State Science Envoy for Space. I'm neither a scientist nor an engineer, but I spent time in space, and I was around a lot of scientists and engineers, so they give me the privilege of coming out and, and talking to you. And, and if you get nothing from my presentation today at all, um, hopefully what, what you will get on whichever campus you happen to be sitting now is the age in which all of you have now come to adulthood. And the opportunities to all of you uh, to collaborate with the United States and other nations around the world in the fields of science and engineering and medicine and the like. So that's, that's my mission, to be quite honest. That's why the, the U.S. State Department allows me to come out uh, as a private citizen and talk to you about the fact that we in the United States welcome your partnership and your friendship, and we want to see it grow. Uh, partners of mine for a long time, the entire time I was with the Obama administration, were the employees at, uh, at ISRO, at the Indian Space Research Organization, an incredible group of people who have a big task ahead of them, which is to, they've already designed it, but now to carry out the, the beginnings of a human space flight program, which will be very challenging. And uh, my hope is that some of you will decide that you want to either go to work for ISRO or you want to go to work for Indian industry, that you will take a part in making that come about. And some, some few of you may actually decide that you want to go to space. So in my brief conversation with you today, hope that I'll give you some ideas about how you can participate, how you can help. Um, I want to ask you, because I think everybody knows what this is. I call it Spaceship Earth. It's the only one we have. So when people talk about uh, trying to go explore other planets or go to other places so that we have a, you know, an alternative ship in the storm if something happens to Earth, don't believe it. This is the only place we have. It is the only planet in the solar system 
that we know can't sustain life. We want to go back to the lunar surface because we think there's lots of work to be done there in doing things like we call in situ resource utilization, uh, where we go and we try to find out what is present on the, on the surface of the moon that we can use to benefit humankind. We are now working with the Japanese. They have a mission called Hayabusa 2 that just this past week actually touched a part of it down on the surface of an asteroid called Ryukyu and is actually going to bring samples back that will be returned to Earth in 2020, next year. Uh, NASA, in cooperation with the French and the Germans and other partners, has a mission called OSIRIS-REx that's now orbiting a, a large asteroid called Bennu. Uh, and in uh, about a year or so, after they finish surveying the surface of the planet, of the, of the asteroid, they'll make a decision on where they want to almost touch down and bring back a significant sample of soil from Bennu. And, and you may ask yourself, why do, we, why, do we, why do we spend time and money going to some asteroid, some rock that's orbiting Earth, and even worse, why do we want to bring something back to Earth? Well, it's because we're innately curious, for one thing, but the other thing is, most scientists believe that uh, in the beginning, uh, we all came from one source, and that all the planets in our solar system uh, came from one mass of material. And so what we try to do is go to as many of those other places and bodies that are in our solar system as we can, take those samples, and try to find out, is there anything in common? So when we went to the moon during the Apollo era and we brought moon rocks back, uh, we studied them. Uh, uh -huh. Did I do something wrong? Oh, okay. Is it working now? All right. You all weren't hearing me all this time? You were? It probably wasn't going into the recorder or whatever. Oh, you all weren't hearing me out in the other land, the hinterland. All right, well, good. Can, I, can you say hello so I'll know you hear me now? Or wave? Or something? Okay. Boy, this is a real lively group right there. Is that us? Which one is the group right here? Hello. Okay, I gave up. I can't wake them up. But as we were saying, um, we try to go to these other places and bring samples back to understand how much they are like or different from our Earth. And so far, believe it or not, looking at lunar samples and stuff, amazingly, we find great commonality in terms of the makeup of the materials that we find. Uh, one of the things that, I, that, that was amazing to me on my first flight into space and, and on my subsequent flights was uh, as you go over areas like this, like over the Sahara Desert there, and you see a big dust storm blow up, you go around Earth once every 90 minutes. So it means one orbit of Earth going one time around the Earth occurs in an hour and a half. So you have 45 minutes of daylight and 45 minutes of darkness. And 16 times every normal Earth day, you see the sunrise and the sunset. And every single sunrise and sunset is absolutely breathtaking. And it never gets old. But as you go around the Earth, your orbit kind of moves around so that you go all the way around Earth in those, in those 16 orbits and end up back where you started the day before. But that dust storm that you see forming up on the Sahara Desert, every once in a while you get a chance to see the dust kind of bubble up into the upper atmosphere and you come back around another time and it's moved a little bit to the west and it's out over the Atlantic Ocean and you come back around another couple of times and it's farther west over the Atlantic Ocean and all of a sudden you come around another time and that same dust storm that was coming out of the Sahara is dropping dust into Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, so the lesson there is that we live on one planet with one ocean and one atmosphere. And uh, a, a really critical lesson from this image is the fact that some of you can see the really thin blue line between the blackness of space in that 45-minute period of time that we call daylight 
and the life that is on earth. And that very thin blue line is our atmosphere. So that's what sustains our life. And in about uh, oh, 30 kilometers of that atmosphere, which is the first 10,000 feet or so, um, that's where the oxygen is. And you get above that, and there's not enough oxygen for you and me to stay alive very long. So you come to the realization that, boy, um, we could be in trouble if we don't protect this atmosphere and we don't protect our oceans. So one of my messages to you today is, this is the only one we got. This is home. And I can go to Mars and I can stay there for, you know, the rest of my life. I'm not going to change that. You can't survive on Mars without some type of artificial breathing devices and things to shield you from radiation. We can live there and we can work there, but I don't think you want to spend your life there because you all look very beautiful here today and you like to walk out in the sunlight and smell the fresh air. You can't do that on Mars. You take your helmet off, you'll take a sniff and <laughs> and I don't want you to do that. So it's really important for us to take care of this. One of the things that I'm asked a lot is, what, what, what was it like when you went to, first, to space for the first time? And I tell people, well, a couple of things. I was technically, I was ready. We had trained for two years. Uh, every time we got into a simulator, it was disaster training. We only saw two things. Two times did everything go right. And it was just before you went down to Florida for your launch attempts. Other than that, every simulator session you had, things were breaking and stuff was exploding and all kinds of things happening because they wanted you to be ready technically for anything that you would encounter. What they didn't prepare me for were the emotional parts of going to space. And so you lay on your back on the launch pad when you finally get ready to go fly and you're, you're there with your crew members and you're laughing and you're joking and you're having a good time until you get to about nine minutes prior to launch and then things start to get very serious and you really pay attention to what's being said and you can hear the the announcer as they go, okay, we're now T-minus 20 seconds and counting. And, and they begin to count down and they say we're at T-minus 15, 10, 9, 8, 7. And at 7 seconds on most spacecraft, you've got what we call the, the, the main engines that are going to carry you all the way to space. And on the space shuttle, we had three of them. So you, all of a sudden you felt and heard this <laughs> and the vehicle shakes and kind of goes like, like it's going to tip over. And it's caught, the motion is caught because there are eight bolts that are about this big around. That's all it is. Eight bolts that are holding up this four million pound stack. And it goes, and the bolts catch and you pop back. And it only took about seven seconds to do that. When you get back here, the computers have checked out all the thousands of parameters in the shuttle and they say it's time to go, and they send a signal to two big rockets on the side called solid rocket boosters that are going to get you out of the atmosphere. And all of a sudden, go, <laughs> big explosion, and <laughs> everything starts to vibrate, and you can feel yourself sink back ever so slightly in your seat, and you can actually feel the vehicle as it starts to roll around, and you go upside down, and you're off to space. And what seems like forever when you train is over in eight and a half minutes. And you spent about 90% of your training time for the previous two years on that eight and a half minutes. Because that's the most dynamic part of the flight where when things go wrong, it could be really bad and they really want you to be ready for it. And so you're kind of looking forward to this ascent and it's over before you know it. Eight and a half minutes, you're in space. And then you get an opportunity to raise your seat and you look out the front window and it is the most spectacular view you can imagine. It's sort of like this. And this doesn't even do it justice because the colors are magnificent. Um, you can see what seems like forever. And for those of you who may be wondering, although I generally don't deal in conspiracy theories, I want you to pay attention to this. It is round, okay? So 
So if you get in an argument with your friend at a bar or in a cafeteria or something else and they want to discuss how flat the earth is, tell them you met this guy who's been there and says, it is round, okay? But the main thing that just startled me, and it's the piece that I wasn't ready for. Like I said, technically, I was ready. You can see I'm a person of African descent. And so I knew that the first piece of land that we would go over once we left the United States would probably be the continent of Africa. And I raised my seat up, and I looked out, and this is somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes into this flight. And you're going around Earth once every 90 minutes, and I saw this big island coming up. At least that's what I thought it was. And then I realized, nope, that big island is the continent of Africa. So I am now going to get to exercise my knowledge of geography because I've been studying for a year African geography so that I would know where, which of those little squares was Nigeria and which one was Liberia and which one was Ghana and which one was Senegal. And all of a sudden, I looked out the window and I went, wow. And I started crying. I physically, literally cried because there were no borders. There were no boundaries. It wasn't like looking at an atlas or a map or a globe. It was just one big, beautiful continent of Africa with no sign of people. Uh, so I thought to myself, you know, if I were a Martian coming to this planet right now and I got to this altitude, I'd probably turn around and go back because I would recognize I had come to the wrong planet. I had come to a place where there is no life, and so I need to go somewhere else. Uh, so you, you, you go to space to find out how insignificant you really are in the grand scheme of things, you know. The fact that they don't even know I'm down here. And, but then you realize the privilege that we have to live on this planet every day. So I learned that the borders and the boundaries and the difference between people about which I had been taught all my life were all artificially generated by me. And that when I went back to Earth, what I told myself then, when I get back home to Earth, I'm going to do my best to figure out why we don't live the way it looks and why we don't get along with each other better. And so that has been a mission of mine from 1986 when I flew my first flight into space. Uh, it's an, a beautiful planet. It's the only one we got, so let's take care of it. You may have to go to the next one for me because this one doesn't seem like it's working right now. Okay, yay. Now, how many of you have ever heard of Elon Musk? Woo, woo. Uh, how many of you remember what Elon wants to do? What's his big goal in life other than sell a lot of Teslas? Huh? SpaceX and he wants you to live where? All of you. Don't do it. You do not want to live on Mars. You want to go visit Mars. And I want you to go visit Mars. But what is most important for all of you, the few of you that may get to do that, is we need for you to come back and tell your story. You know, we need for you to come back and talk about what it was like, just like I just told you about my first time in space. You know, we can tell people all the time what something's like, but what's the best, what is the best way to teach anybody anything? And we don't always get a chance to do it. It's the experience. You're in a technical institution here. So when the professors tell you about something, sometimes you sit there and in your deepest part of your mind, you're saying, right. And then all of a sudden, lab comes up. Can you relate to this? And there's a Bunsen burner or there's a, volt meter or an air meter or something, the prof professor says, okay, remember that stuff we were talking about the other day? Let's do it. And your whole world changes because it's no longer a simulation. This is real. There is nothing like the experience of putting your hands in goo or if you're going to be a doctor, letting your hands get bloody someday because that's life and that's what you're going to have to do. Or if you're an engineer, a mechanical engineer, taking some little things that don't look like anything and putting them together and make something that actually works and makes a difference in people's lives. So, 
So we now do that off this planet. And we do it on this settlement, which we call the International Space Station. And for any of you who have someone in your lives who is 18 years or younger, they have never, drink, they have never breathed a single day, not a single second of their lives when somebody hasn't been living and working on this platform, this habitat, this settlement, off the planet, doing things for you and me, doing scientific research, uh, whether it's biomedical research or pharmaceuticals development or materials processing or fire science or something. And there's always multiple nations represented on this because it is the International Space Station. Now, here's my challenge to you. When you graduate, no matter what your major, um, ask questions and find out whether or not you can do some experimentation on the International Space Station. Uh, one way to find out is to communicate with the folk in ISRO, in the Indian Space Research Organization, say, hey, can I participate in some of the research that's going on on the International Space Station? They may say, mm -hmm. We don't exactly do that. And then you should say, all right, and I'm counting on the young ladies in here, since this is Women's History Month back in the U.S., be pushy. Say, but I want to do research. And I, some guy told me one day when he was at my school that things act differently when you take gravity out of the equation. And so if I'm doing biomedical research and I'm trying to help women understand the disease that we call osteoporosis where they lose bone mass and and they get brittle and my bones break easier I understand that if I do some research on the International Space Station I can simulate that or I can reproduce it not simulate it because astronauts actually start to experience bone mass loss like on day two so things are really accelerated and astronauts don't they don't come back with lowered, lowered bone mass anymore. But it took us years to understand what we could do to, to remedy that. So now we have incredible exercise apparatus. I'm going to show you a video, and you'll see astronauts exercising all the time. We changed our diet. We have medication if you need it. Uh, we consult with doctors all the time when an astronaut is on board the International Space Station for six months because we're really concerned about the, the health of the crew member and so sometimes when astronauts come back now after six months, they're stronger than they were before they left. And it's because of the changes that we've made in the, in the, regi the regimen of an astronaut on board the International Space Station. So this is our settlement off Earth right now where we do a lot of work for you. Next one. This will give you an example of some of the science that goes on, and I'm just going to let you look at it, read it, and listen to the music so you can turn the music up. That's Scott Kelly, who lived on station for a year. Some of the exercise apparatus that make us stronger when we come back than we were when we left nowadays. This is actually the first time that a crew ate their own vegetables. So this is lettuce that was grown on the International Space Station. Most of what we do there is to make life better for people here on the planet. So we're looking at trying to find ways to make an astronaut healthier and safer but the, the bottom line is we want to make life better for people back here on the planet. Every one of those flags in that picture just a little while ago represents a nation that has actually had a crew member on the International Space Station. And my point to you is there's no reason that the Indian flag shouldn't be there in that circle. Next one. 
we're going to talk a little bit now about something that NASA did uh, during the Obama administration that brought us to where we are today. Um, you know, we, we had been flying the space shuttle for almost 30 years. We ended up at the end of, uh, at when we retired, the finally retired the shuttle in July of 2011, we had 30 years of absolutely incredible experience off this planet in the space shuttle. Um, but it was time to retire it, not because of any issues about safety, but because we really did want to go on and go to deep space. We wanted to go back to the moon and on to Mars, and a winged vehicle is not, is just not right for that. It, it doesn't have the ability of surviving reentry and the reentry heating and the pressures and everything else, so we have to go back to a capsule. So the decision was made that we would rely on our commercial partners, our American industry and, and industry around the world, because people have been building spacecraft for us for 50 years, and they, had, they knew what they were doing. And so we decided, rather than be very specific about we want a vehicle of this size, this color, this, that, we want a vehicle, we're going to tell them, we want a vehicle that can safely carry humans to space and bring them back. And that's all we said. And so companies like SpaceX and Boeing and Sierra Nevada and others gave us their designs and their ideas, and we kind of collaborated with them and talked about it, and we said, okay, we like that design, so we're going to give you a set amount of money, and then you go build us the vehicle. If, if, if we can certify it, we will pay you each time we fly it. So we buy the service today. The spacecraft belong to the manufacturer. They belong to SpaceX and Boeing, and that's our public-private partnership. So that's the way we operate today. So next slide. This was one of our earliest partners. They were originally a company called, they were an entrepreneurial company when they started called Orbital Sciences. Uh, their headquarters is right outside of Dulles Airport. If you go to Washington, D.C. today, uh, the, the Orbital Sciences facility is there. It's now Northrop Grumman because they, they got bought by a big company. But this is the Cygnus spacecraft. Uh, they went, they did something different. Rather than build it in-house, they came to Europe and they worked with the Italians, a company called Talisalania, and so Talisalania builds their capsule. And they went to Ukraine, and they bought a rocket from the Ukrainians, and then they got a rocket engines that had formerly been Russian rocket engines for the, for the Soviet lunar program that never got off, the, don't mean any pun here, never got off the ground, and so they had they put these different components together from three different countries and came up with uh, Antares and the Cygnus spacecraft. And so they carry, now carry cargo to space for uh, NASA and for our international partners. Next slide. SpaceX was the next one, and uh, the SpaceX Dragon. This was actually the first commercially developed vehicle that went to space, safely came back to Earth, bringing things with it. So this is the... This is the company that changed the paradigm uh, because they changed their innovation was business innovation. It wasn't technological innovation. There is very much, there's not very much that SpaceX does that's new in terms of technical design or, or components in their vehicles. They changed the model in business. They said, we're going to build everything in-house, every component, and we're going to sell way cheaper than anybody else. And in so doing, they have driven the cost of launch down remarkably. It's not where it needs to be for normal people to be able to go fly in space, but we're getting there. And that's what really excites people. That's one of the things that really excites people about SpaceX, is they've changed the model in terms of business. Next one. This is kind of uh, the way we get crews back and forth to space right now until Boeing and SpaceX get their two vehicles certified. It's the Russian Soyuz, and it's the vehicle that we used from 2004, 2003, after we lost the Columbia in, in a shuttle accident and decided that we would use the Russian spacecraft to get crews to the space station while we used the shuttle for the remainder of its lifetime to carry the construction crews, the astronauts who would finish the construction of the, of the International Space Station, which we finally did in 2010, uh, in order to retire it in 2011. Next one. This one is, uh, represents another of our international partners. It's called HTV, built by the Japanese space agency JAXA. And this gave us some redundancy, uh, which we really needed when we went through one year. It was about a three-month period of time that we lost uh, a Cygnus on a launch accident, a SpaceX Dragon after launch when the vehicle went out of control, 
and then a sister vehicle to the Soyuz progressed. So in three months, we lost all three of our primary cargo carriers. Had we not had more redundancy in the form of the HTV from Japan and an ATV from Europe, we would not have had a way to get supplies to the crew of the International Space Station, and we may have had to bring them home. But we, you know, we had some redundancy, and so we were able to do that. Showing the critical importance of partnerships, uh, international partnerships as well as public-private partnerships. And last one here is the Dream Chaser. This has not flown yet. It's made by a company called Sierra Nevada out of Colorado in the United States. I love it because I'm a pilot, and it's a winged vehicle, and you can bring it back, and you can land on a runway. Uh, so we don't have a vehicle that can do that now since we've retired the shuttle. So we're really excited about getting Dream Chaser back in the inventory so that we can bring crews and other things back from space, land them on a runway where we can get to it really quickly. This would come in very, very handy if we ever had a real serious medical emergency where you had to get a crew member back to Earth pretty quickly. We land in the water on most of our spacecraft now. We're in the desert with the Russians, and so it's just, it takes too long to get to a crew member if you ever need to, you know, something that's, that's, that's dramatically important. Next one. This is where we are today. SpaceX last weekend flew the first commercially, ve commercially launched vehicle designed and built to carry crews to space. They launched from the Kennedy Space Center, docked with the International Space Station. They've got a couple more days there. They're going to undock and then autonomously come back and they'll land in the Pacific Ocean. We'll work with SpaceX to go ahead and look at all the data, evaluate how the flight went, and if everything goes well, NASA will certify the, the, the Crew Dragon to carry humans, and the next time it goes to space, it'll have a crew of four on board, uh, including three NASA astronauts and Chris Ferguson, um, not Chris Ferguson, but, but four NASA astronauts, because they'll actually be flying the vehicle for SpaceX. The Boeing CST-100, or Starliner, will be the next commercially available vehicle that should fly sometime within a month or two, do its demonstration flight, same thing that SpaceX did, come back, and once we've attested that it's okay, then it will start to carry humans to space. So some of you out here in this audience may one day go to space in a Dragon, Crew Dragon, or in a CST-100. Next slide. This is a partner that we don't have yet. Um, the Chinese Space Agency has a very robust program very well organized. They have a 25-year plan and a good program in place. Um, personally, I would like to be flying and operating with them, but, but the U.S. government, our law right now, prohibits us from bilateral activities with China. Uh, but that's something that we're working through, we're negotiating, and, and I anticipate that sometime in the near future, we may actually kind of join hands with the Chinese Space Agency so that we have everybody, every spacefaring nation on Earth, flying together uh, because it's really important. Next slide. These are some of the things now. Think about what you're doing here at the university, what you're studying to be able to do. You can probably find it on this slide, whether it's manufacturing things uh, in space manufacturing using 3D printing, what we call additive manufacturing. For the first time now, we have three 3D printers on board the International Space Station. And what's new is we can now print mental metal components. Up until now, all we could do was print plastic because we didn't exactly understand how to contain the powder that we use for 3D printing of metals like you probably do here on the campus. We now have a device or a mechanism that allows us to do that. So we can actually print components for a rocket engine or print components for a telescope or print components for something else in space. So we don't have to take all that to space. It cuts down on the weight that you're having to take to space. That too contributes to cutting down on the cost of going to space. Um, advertising and branding. Uh, that's one of my favorite. When I was the NASA administrator, I said, no way. We're not sticking any ads on the side of NASA spacecraft. Well, now that we use commercial partners who have vehicles that not only NASA uses, but their private customers use, it's kind of hard for NASA to tell them you can't advertise. And so it will not surprise me if you won't see pretty soon a spacecraft launching out of the Kennedy Space Center with uh, Tata products on the side you know, or something like that. So, so advertising and branding is something that's being looked at right now all the way out to our, the, I think, the mo one of the most important things we do, which is education and outreach. Almost every single day of the time that, that astronauts on the International Space Station, they take about an hour out of their day and they do interactive video teleconferencing with students in classrooms around the world. Very, very, very important part of what they do. 
Next slide. And this is another, oh, this is the, <coughs> this is sort of a pictorial of the plan. There are more than 25 nations that have been getting together for more than 15, 20 years now, thinking about where humanity should be going next. And the general consensus is Mars is where humans should be going. So that's the agreement among multiple nations of the world. They've documented that in something called the Global Exploration Roadmap. If you're interested in it and you want to see the details, just go online and look for Global Exploration Roadmap, or GER, and you can read uh, what this picture shows you there. The fact that we all agree 50 years of operating in low-Earth orbit has been good, but it's time to move on. So we're, we're looking to try to hand over control and operations in low-Earth orbit to the commercial sector, to entrepreneurs and commercial entities and academics, while NASA and JAXA and ISRO and others move out to lunar, to lunar orbit operations where we can go to the surface of the moon and put humans back down there or go on to Mars. And then finally, that'll be the, the decade of the 20s, and then finally in the decade of the 2030s, we'll move on out to Mars where humans will, for the first time, be able to land on another, land and operate and live for a while on another planet. So I'm excited about that. Some of you will get to do that. I doubt that I will get to do it, but, but my plan is to watch you go do it. So I plan to still be around when we do that. The next one I'm going to show you is another video, and it will give you, I think it is. We'll find out, okay? If it is, it'll be a video that we call Exploration Mission 1, and it's the, it'll be the first flight of NASA's heavy lift launch vehicle and the Orion crew module that's designed to carry humans to the moon and on to Mars. And so people always like to say, yeah, but that's just on a drawing board. It's just an idea. Not so. For a number of years now, we've actually been going through the construction. We're almost finished with the construction of, of the, the space launch system, the heavy lift launch vehicle. Orion has actually flown. It flew, we flew it on a test flight back in December of 2014. And in this video, you're actually going to see a very short clip of what it looked like sitting in the pilot seat if a person had been in there looking out the window as the ablative coating, the, the thermal protection system, burns off of the vehicle around them. So I'll, I'll tell you when we get to that. But, but this is what's going on today all over the world at, at plants and manufacturing facilities and test facilities all over the world, not just in the United States, to enable us to go back to the moon and then on to Mars. So next one, I think this is it. I think. We'll find out. Maybe. Nope. That's the Lunar Orbit Gateway. Okay. I forgot about this. This, I talked about going back to the, to the moon and orbiting the moon and, and going down or going on to Mars. This is a facility that's going to allow us to do this. So it will be a, a way station or like a, like a bus terminal. You know, you take astronauts from Earth to the Lunar Orbit Gateway, and some will go down to, Mar to the surface of the moon. Some will travel on to Mars. Some will stay in lunar orbit on the gateway and do experimentation and the like. So, so that's, that's what we're working on right now. Now the next one. This is actually one of the propellant tanks. It's the hydrogen tank being assembled down in a place called Mishu outside of New Orleans, Louisiana. The nose cone for uh, one of the solid rocket boosters. That's the launch tower at the Kennedy Space Center. This is an artist's depiction of what it's going to look like when we launch the first time. These are old shuttle main engines that we've repurposed. Four of them go onto the space launch system uh, to lift it away from Earth and get it on into, into Earth orbit testing of both the engines. This is testing the solid rocket boosters out in uh, Provo, Utah. The shroud that actually protects Orion while it's going away, while it's flying through the atmosphere, leaving Earth. And that's Orion and the service module. The service module is actually built by the European Space Agency in Turin in Italy. We put them together at the Kennedy Space Center, and they fly in space together. The service module provides power and propulsion uh, for Orion. And this is the picture coming up. That's actually looking out the windows of Orion at Earth uh, with the ablative tile or the ablative material 
burning off to protect the crew on the inside. So that's what's going on right now. That's the testing and the construction that's underway and completed and everything. Uh, last slide I'm going to show you. Go ahead and put that one up. Um, and again, this is my, my final message to you before we go to questions and answers. You can go to the next one. How many of you saw the movie Hidden Figures? Yes. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. You said Katherine Johnson. I apologize. <laughs> I didn't know. He's absolutely right. The movie Hidden Figures, if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. So go online or go do something, Netflix or Google or something, and uh, it's an absolutely incredible movie about you and me. It's a, it's a movie about the success of the human spirit, how people overcome advers er, adversity. It just happened to be women this time, but these were uh, women of, the, and they were not just black women. There were, even white women were relegated to the back rooms in those days because that's all women could do. They, they weren't allowed to fly and do things, so they became, even though they were engineers and they had to battle to become engineers, they were relegated to take their pens and pencils and do manual calculations because we didn't have computers back then. And this is the way that we were able to go to space initially. And Katherine Johnson was the one person who stepped forward when NASA could not figure out how we execute leaving Earth orbit transition to lunar orbit and then safely allow ourselves to get captured by moon's gravity so that we can get into lunar orbit and then how do you come back? So Katherine Johnson became a, not a well-known person as a matter of fact. I spent 14 years in NASA as an astronaut. I had never heard of Katherine Johnson. Neither had most other people uh, other than the people who worked with her. So this was a story of the, the human spirit and it's a story that all of us should want to emulate. Uh, overcome adversity and do great things. So that's Katherine Johnson. Go see Hidden Figures if you haven't already seen it. You all have been excellent. Now it's your turn. You're gonna, I'm going to bring the moderator up, and we're going to do a little bit of Q&A with you. And um, study really hard while you're here. Listen to the professors. You may not think they know what they're talking about, but they do. Uh, try to emulate them. Be very careful and observe them because you may be, I never dreamed of being an astronaut growing up. Um, but I saw, I met a young man one time who always dreamed of doing it, became one, and, uh, and, and challenged me to dream about it, and so I did. So just think about it. I want you all to go to space. I want you to see, the, see this planet the way I've had an opportunity to see it, and I want you to do great things for yourselves in India. So we'll take your questions now. Okay, we're going to pull them up here. Are you, you going to sit us down or are we going to stand up? We'll stand. Good afternoon. Hello. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my question is that Trump administration just announced that they are going to build up a space force. So do you really think that our, our planet needs a space force right now? You know, my answer is not going to please you because I work the civil space program. And in, in the United States, there is a really hard wall between civil and military space. And so representing NASA, as, as I used to do, I don't, I, don't, I don't offer opinions to the people on the, on the DOD side. So you'll have to find somebody else who can answer that for you. I, I don't know. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, so my question is, uh, how did the transition, uh, your transition from a pilot 
to an astronaut take place and uh, how open are the opportunities now for us as uh, as graduates uh, to become an astronaut because oh. i follow because i follow ins on uh, on asa on instagram i see 17 year old uh, students uh, are being trained to become astronauts now so how open are the opportunities and uh, uh, what what reasons uh, uh, may exist to for, Na for nasa to look out for uh, for uh, astronauts who are more uh, older than the ones who are being trained right now okay and i have to apologize because i didn't hear it all um Got it. Here's the reason I told you to challenge ISRO. Okay? The Indian Space Research Organization is putting together their human space flight program. And they're coming up with a, with a process of selection, you know, recruitment, selection, and then training of astronauts. And that's not known yet. That's, they, haven't, they haven't made all the final decisions. So uh, some of you will have an opportunity to help them with selection and training. Some of you who want to be astronauts will have to apply and you'll have to, you ask me how did I make the transition? I told you I never dreamed of being an astronaut. I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. I grew up in a segregated environment so we had two black schools. I went to one of them and we had a bunch of white schools that I couldn't go to. And white kids dreamed of being astronauts because every astronaut you saw when I was growing up was white Anglo-Saxon Protestant military test pilot. So they were they were like one group of people. So it never occurred to me that I could be an astronaut. The good thing for me uh, was I had a couple of things that I did want to do. I saw a program on television once called Men of Annapolis, talked about life at the Naval Academy. And I decided I wanted to go to the Naval Academy because I love the uniform. I had no clue what I was going to be getting myself into. But I love the uniform, and I really love the way all the beautiful women came to the campus on the weekends. So I chose the Naval Academy for college. I struggled to get there because you had to have an appointment, and I couldn't get an appointment from my home state at the time because of segregation, but I managed to get there. And when I finally got there, I found that it wasn't all I thought it was going to be. It was really tough, uh, but I managed to hang in there. My father would tell me every weekend when I cried and call home and said, I want to come home. He'd say, hang in there one more week. And so I hung in there for 52 weeks and got through the first year. And, uh, but, but what happened in that first year was the senior military officer who was responsible for my group was a Marine. I told myself two things when I left high school. I will not go into the Marine Corps under any circumstances because they're crazy. And I will not fly airplanes under any circumstance because that's dangerous. And I don't want to do that. But when it was time to graduate four years later, I looked back on my time there and I said, I want to be like him. He had so impressed me that I made the decision I know what I said when I came here, but forget it. I want to be like him. And so I set out from the Naval Academy to become a Marine, to become an infantry officer, and I found out I did not like crawling around in the mud. And I looked for an alternative. I had married my wife three days after graduation. She didn't like the idea of me being a Marine anyway, and she kept saying, why don't we go to Pensacola? And I said, but that's where airplanes are. She said, I know. Uh, why don't we go to Pensacola? So I finally gave in, and we went to Pensacola, Florida. First time I got in an airplane for, te for flying, for training, I fell in love with it. We lifted off, and I went, wow, I cannot believe this. And over the course of my instruction, I met a lot of people who impressed me. One of them was a Marine Corps test pilot who talked about life as a test pilot, how demanding it was. And so I decided right then that I wanted to be a test pilot. So I worked for the next six or seven years to qualify to be a test pilot, and I was finally selected by the Marine Corps, and I went there. And all this time, I had watched Neil Armstrong land on the moon when I was in flight school. Still didn't want to be an astronaut. That just, that was not in, that was not going to happen for me. And then while I was serving as a test pilot, a, a young black, a, uh, actually a, a guy with a PhD in laser physics by the name of Ron McNair, who had been selected in the first group of space shuttle astronauts, came to visit the, the test pilot school with some of, some of my former friends and he talked to me for a whole weekend about what life was like for him as a brand new astronaut candidate. And before he left, he asked me if I was going to apply for the program. I said, not on your life. And he looked at me startled because he was certain he had convinced me to do this. And he said, why not? I said, they'd never pick me. He looked seriously, sternly at me. He said, you know, that is the dumbest thing I ever heard. He said, how do you know? How do you know if you don't ask? And so he embarrassed me, made me feel really small because I'd forgotten what my mom and dad taught me growing up, that I could do anything I wanted to do if I set my mind to it. So, so I picked up pen and paper, applied, and I was interviewed and then selected 
in the next group, the second group of space shuttle astronauts. So that's how I got there. So going from Marine Corps test pilot to astronaut, for me, was a relatively easy transition. I found out that, yeah, they would pick me. And yeah, I could compete. And yeah, I could learn. I mean, I struggled the first, first, few, the first few months trying to learn all the stuff about the space shuttle. But I ended up spending 14 years there, flew to space four times, and then made the transition back away from NASA uh, when my family sat me down one day while I was getting ready to go on my final space shuttle mission and asked me what I was going to do when I grow up. And I didn't have an answer, to be quite honest. I was having fun. You know, I was flying to space and stuff like that. But my wife and my two kids who had uh, enjoyed my being an astronaut with me, but 10 days after I came back from my first flight, we lost Challenger. And we lost Ron McNair and his crew. And so they went from stark, from having just a great time with me as an astronaut to the stark reality of the risk of going to space. And they let me fly three more times, but they finally sat me down and said, OK, you got to grow up. And so I, had, um, I ended up getting an opportunity to go back to the Naval Academy. And that helped with my transition back uh, to the operating forces of the Marine Corps. And I stayed there for another eight years before I retired and then made the most difficult transition, which was from serving the government for 40, almost 40 years, well, 34 years of my life to being a standard old civilian. That was hard. One, because I was leaving behind Marines who I still love to this day, who are absolutely incredible people. And I knew that I would not be getting on an airplane or, you know, getting on a ship or doing something with Marines again. And that, that was kind of difficult for me. But that's how I got here. Incredible story, sir. Uh, I'll take one last question from the NOW's audience. And I'll next, next give a chance to RV College. So RV College may get ready for the next question. I'll take one last question from the audience here. Yeah, the guy in the white shirt there. Can you pass on the mic to him? Next, RV College, please be ready with your question. Good afternoon, sir. Hi. So you have companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin who do, th who do things differently. Their main mission is to keep the space travel cost, space travel cost as, low, as low as possible. But when this uses the concept of modularity, I believe, they reuse the components is what I have heard. But when it comes to NASA and other conventional uh, organizations, why couldn't they implement this you know, pretty earlier and bring the cost down? That is my question. Why couldn't they use the same pr principles and bring because the cost down? Because we, we weren't thinking in a, in a disruptive fashion. Pretty simple answer. You know, th th I asked kids this morning, not kids, I asked students this morning what, uh, I was in a class and I said, um, you know, I want you to be disruptors. And that's what I'm saying to you. I want you to be disruptors. Uh, I want you to think out of the, not out of the box, but think into the corners of the box. Think about a box. You know where we never operate in a box? Nobody ever goes into the corners. It's kind of tight in there. We talk about working outside the box. What NASA found when we started working with uh, commercial companies like SpaceX and everybody else, um, you know, we had used, well, the law says you can't do this, or regulation says you can't do that. That wasn't true at all. You had to go to the corners of the box to do innovative things. And so SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic and some of these other companies help us to work ourselves into the corner of the box. And that's where we are today. And that's why I was showing you where we are with public-private partnerships. Your job, your responsibility, your obligation to India is to think in the corners of the box. You know, it, it's fine to go outside the box. but. But work in the corners of the box first. Get everything you can out of what is already available to you. And we frequently do not do that. And the one thing I loved about being a test pilot, you fly in the corners of the box all the time because you spend a lot of money on an aircraft. And you want it to be everything that it can do. And you don't find that out unless you go right to the ragged edge where if you get outside there, bad things are going to happen. But test pilots get paid to fly it to the corner of the box so bad things don't happen to other people. Because when airplanes don't work right, it's not the pilot's fault, generally. There's something wrong in the way we design the aircraft. So, uh, you know, work inside the box. You can do that. Thank you. Thank yeah. You so much. Thank you. Can we, can we? I'm sorry. We'll give you the mic, madam, one minute. One minute. Yeah, just start.
Could we somewhere know how to draw the line between, you know, this romanticization of space in movies, in Bollywood, in Hollywood, and space actually being yeah. used for the purpose of yeah. good of mankind? And I'd love yeah. to hear you said you can go to Mars and live there. Thank yeah. you so yeah. much yeah. for that. <laughs> you know, I, her question is, how do we draw the line between the romanticization of space? Like, one of my favorite movies is The Martian. A and while The Martian romanticizes space, the good thing about The Martian, whatever they call it here in India, is it was really true for the most part. So we really, d but we do have to help people determine the difference between science fiction and science fact. And in NASA, we turn sometimes turn science fiction into science fact. That was my theme. We turn science fiction into science fact and we make the impossible possible. So the difference between the fantasization, fantasization that you see in the movies and what's really going on is, is up here with us. We can make it happen, but you're absolutely right. I recommend that somebody who's serious about it, like most of you who really want to become a part of the space program, want to become, com become participants in the, in the family of spacefaring nations, is go to reliable sources. Go to the website for NASA. And, and we have a, just go up in the search box, and we have a, a feature on NASA's website called Real Martians, where we show real live NASA engineers, scientists, pilots, who are doing real live things today that are going to get us to Mars. Not the science, not the stuff from movies, but, but the stuff we're really going to do. So go to, go to sources where you can see what people are doing today. Uh, NASA has a tremendous feature this month because it's Women's History Month, and it's a whole series of articles and images and movies about women in NASA. And it talks about the accomplishments of women all the way from from Katherine Johnson up to today, where the 29th of this month, the 29th of March, we're going to do something that has never, ever, ever been done before. I know people say, but how, what can you do that's never been done before? We've never had two women go outside a spacecraft together on a spacewalk. 29th of March, we're going to have the first two female astronauts go out and do a spacewalk together. So, you know, things are happening. Great, yeah. great, sir. Can we have a question from RV College, please? Question from RV College. Yeah. Please ask your question. Thank you for the, thank you for the fabulous presentation, sir. That was indeed informative. Thank you. Uh, we are right now trying to build satellites in our college. My question to you is, how is NASA preparing to tackle the radiation that happens in long-term missions, yeah. such as the space launch systems that are bound for Mars? So what is the technology behind tackling the radiation? Yeah. The, the, if you didn't hear the question, it, it was what are we doing to combat radiation threats, mainly to humans, but also to, to instruments and the like. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Uh, one is we study the environment so that we know what the threat is. Going back sort of to the, the question that the, young, that the lady asked here, you know, we have been, we've had these stories about people going into space who leave Earth's atmosphere will die because of the radiation. Well, we now have data from 50 years of flying in space and flying to other places. We've got three spacecraft that have left the solar system. And those three spacecraft tells, tell us that while there is a harsh radiation environment out there, we don't think it's an environment that's going to kill a human being. Now, what we don't know precisely and what we need to know is what's the quality of life for an astronaut who goes and lives on Mars for three months and is exposed to the increased radiation, are they going to lose one note, I mean, one dot of IQ, or are they going to become, you know, over time, start operating slower than they would have done if they hadn't gone to Mars? We don't know those answers yet. But we're confident that, we're, that we can live and work in the radiation environment that we'll find on Mars. There are some environments, however, where we won't even be able to send robots. We are really interested in studying the, the water on the water moon called Europa, which is a giant moon of Jupiter. Uh, it's covered in ice, and we really suspect that there is living organisms in the, in the ocean of Europa under that ice shell. The problem is if we send a spacecraft there to try to orbit Europa and study it, its radiation environment is so intense that it will fry it in a matter of days. So we've got to be in, we're working right now to try to figure out ingenious ways to fly around Jupiter, swing out to the outside of Europa, come back, swing inside between Jupiter and Europa, such that we can get the data we need without 
putting a satellite into the environment where it's going to get fried. So don't know whether that Thank answers you. your Thank question. You. Thank you. Yeah. Can we have a question from BMS? Can we have a question from BMS? Next will be PS University. Please get ready. Now question from BMS. Whoop. There is one. Yep. Please ask your question. One of the interesting problems I thought the astronauts would face is like when we go out of atmosphere and on lunar and Mars missions, there's either lower gravity or no gravity at all. So what do you think will be the long-term implications of this for astronauts and for missions in general? Yeah. The question pertains to what about long duration periods of time on the moon or Mars where the gravity environment is lower than it is on, on Earth? Remember I said we've been living and working on the International Space Station now for a little bit more than 18 years. That's a microgravity environment. So, so what we've done is we've learned how to, how to live with and how to compensate for the, for the absence of gravity. Several things the human body needs gravity for. One is in addition to keeping you on the planet, uh, but we can work around that. But we need it for just for balance. The neurovestibular system uh, depends on the gravity vector because it's got these things in your ear, inner ear that we call otoliths. And you can use your, you can call them blades of grass or you can call them stones or whatever. But the otoliths respond to the gravity vector. And so you can do this with me. Tilt your head one way, close your eyes, tilt your head, and see how you can tell whether it's tilted or not. That's because the otoliths move because they're responding to the change in the gr gravity vector. When you go to space, gravity is overcome. So you do this, and you do this, and you get upside down, and nothing changes. The otoliths just kind of stick up, and the signal that goes to your brain is everything's okay. And the brain goes, no, it's not. Because I can see through my eyes that you're upside down. Everything is not okay. So somebody explain this to me, and I'm, I'm animating this a little bit. And so the brain goes to the stomach, and it asks the stomach, what's wrong with this picture? Why does everything look upside down, and yet I think I'm upside right? And if the stomach can't answer it, in the case of some humans, it rejects everything that's in it. And so you get sick, and that's what we call space motion sickness or space adaptation syndrome. Very, very, very few astronauts go to that extreme. If you read medical journals, they'll tell you that the majority of people who go to space suffer space adaptation syndrome. That's sort of true. Almost everybody who goes to space experiences something that's different from being here on Earth. So that the, the range of space adaptation syndrome is broad. So we have already learned how to compensate for the lack of gravity. So being in a, you know, in a low gravity environment is a lot better than being in the microgravity environment of the International Space Station where we've, we've been operating now for 18 years. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Now, uh, thank you. Now we'll take question from PES University. Next, I'll next I'll pass on to Nitte. May Nitte be ready next. Now PES. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. My question is, what does the future hold for deep space exploration missions like the Voyager? Oh, what, what is deep space? space exploration mission? Yeah. What is deep? How important do you think is deep space exploration? Yeah, I, I got it. Okay. <laughs> It's question pertained to what does deep space exploration hold for companies like Blue Origin? And I think what you mean is for commercial entities and entrepreneurs and the like, non-governmental entities. Um, th th you know, our hope is there's a lot of work to be done, remaining to be done in low Earth orbit. And so if you remember that, that, that uh, sort of the diagram that I showed you, we've still got to work. We, we will be working in low Earth orbit for a long, long time. Trying to make sure that we're, you know, we're, the technologies are improving and we're designing new things that will work when we get to the, to the moon and when we get on out to Mars. Um, and besides, a lot of the things that we want to do in the microgravity environment of space, you don't need to go any farther than low Earth orbit to do them. So commercial entities, if they want to make money, are probably going to find that it's more profitable to be in low Earth orbit where they're doing, in, in, uh, whether it's biomedical research, uh, pharmaceutical development, materials processing, uh, in-space manufacturing, those things can be done in low Earth orbit. There's no reason to go all the way out to the lunar surface or to the moon or to Mars, especially to Mars. 
Now, there is a community in the, in the commercial world, and they're mostly in the venture capital slash um, entrepreneurial world that believe that there is great value in going somewhere like asteroids or the moon or Mars and mining for things. If you go back to what I talked about earlier about why we go to space and why are we taking samples of asteroids and the like, we actually believe that almost all this stuff came from the same place. So if you're going to go all the way to, the, to an asteroid to look for a rare earth metal, my theory is you're going to find that it's like earth. And the same rare earth metals that are on earth and are hard to get to are going to be present on an asteroid in the same proportion as those rare earth metals here on earth. And so what we've the business case that has to be proven is that it's worth the expense of going all the way to an asteroid mining something that can be gotten here on Earth and then bringing it back and making it useful. That's not to say that it, that it should not be done or can be done. I just say we don't know. And so that's why we do what we do. We don't know, and so we experiment. And, and I think, you know, that's where I, I don't think Blue Origin has any desire to do that. Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin, his passion is humans in space. He wants people, just like I said, he wants people to be able to have the experience of traveling to space just for the, the opportunity to see this planet uh, in the way that other people have not seen it before. And, and he'll do that through tourism, space tourism. Thank you. C can we have the question from Nick Tay? And next will be Rama University. Question from Nick Tay, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, we are from Nick Tay, and uh, like we have established a Center for Small Satellite Research Center, and we have already uh, successfully launched a picture satellite. And uh, we are working on the design and development of uh, a nano satellite as of now. So I want to ask the question: How we can explore this? Like we have established the infrastructure and establishment for this particular uh, satellite research program. How we can explore with the collaboration with NASA for this nano satellite design and development program? First of all, I think my 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 first answer to you would be: You don't need to explore collaboration with NASA. You've got your own space agency. You've got ISRO, and, and what we're trying, what I'm trying to do, is encourage better collaboration between ISRO and NASA, such that together we work to enable you to do the work with Pico satellites that you want to do. Um, I, I mention again, the United States has the National Laboratory, that is the U.S. segment of the International Space Station, and the National Laboratory is there for the use of anybody. And if ISRO comes to NASA and says, you know, we've got some experiments that we want to run in the U.S. National Lab, I'm certain that will happen. Uh, we've already launched uh, CubeSat, a CubeSat for an elementary school from Arlington, Virginia. So if we could launch a CubeSat from the International Space Station for an elementary school, certainly we can take the PicoSats from, uh, from I you call it NITI? Okay, so I would say work with your, work with your your team from ISRO uh, and help them get to their, you know, develop their human space flight program such that, that it operates the way that you all want to do it and it's beneficial to India. Don't, don't try to mimic NASA or work for NASA or make NASA better, make ISRO better. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Now can we have a question from Ramaya University? Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, there was a beautiful presentation. Thank you. So, uh, my question in two parts. So uh, the first one being on a be being on a lighter note. Uh, so in every uh, science fiction movies, NASA is the one which saves the Earth at the end. But <laughs> how difficult is it for NASA to really save the Earth when you have a president who doesn't believe in climate change? Thank you. Uh, okay. And on a, on a serious note, the second part. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, on the second part. Uh, so the Indian Space Research Organization launched the uh, mission called Mangalyan to orbit the Mars, and the budget of this uh, mission was 74 million US dollars. So every space movies which we have known, uh, the maybe Gravity, The Martian, or Interstellar has a budget from uh, 100 million to 180 million dollars. And uh, 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 the America, NASA launched uh, Mars uh, Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution, the MAVEN program, uh, which has a budget of 650 million, which is nearly nine times greater than what uh, the ISRO cost. So why is the space programs from NASA is so 
uh, you know, expensive when compared to the space programs that are conducted by ISRO. So yeah, that's what I'll Thank you. Uh, and, and it, that's, I'm not sure that your first question about President Trump was a question <laughs> or a statement, <laughs> but, but, let me, uh, but, but let me respond as best I can in this way in case it was a question. Um, and I, I, when I talk to young, young women a lot, and, I, and this, is not, this is not funny and not intended to be funny, I, I talk to young women a lot uh, about trying to get people not to hate them or not to, not to harass them or not to mistreat them or not to treat them unfairly. And, and everybody, you know, so what do I, they say, what, or, or an African American, what do I say to make somebody not hate me? My response is, don't waste your time. Do your work and do it well, and you will be rewarded. And if it happens to be in the workplace and you're a young woman who has been not, not treated, tr treated fairly, you do your work, you do well, you get rewarded, you become the boss, then you talk to them. And you can take action. You don't have to worry about trying to convince them. The one good thing about the United States is everybody has an opinion. And everybody has a right to say whatever they want. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's the President of the United States or my baby granddaughter. Uh, their opinions are all the same. So I, I don't question what the President says. He can't keep me from believing what I believe. Uh, I know that the climate is changing. You know that the climate is changing. Most people on this planet know that the climate is changing. And so it's incumbent upon us, just like I said, it's important for you to encourage ISRO to be the kind of space agency you want it to be and to help India take its rightful place among the leaders in the family of spacefaring nations it is incumbent upon all of us to recognize the fact that, as I showed you in, in my, my early slide, that's the only place we got is Earth. And it's incumbent upon us to keep it a place that sustains us and, en and enables us to enjoy life. You know. People who doubt that or question that, you know, they'll be able to doubt it and question it for the rest of their lives because you did what you did to enable them to remain free and safe and everything else. So that's our job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, we had a nice time at presentation and the interaction. I hope you also had. Great. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you all very much. Good afternoon, everyone, distinguished guests, dignitaries, invitees, guests, students, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure and profound duty proposing a vote of thanks to this program. We would like to express our heartfelt thanks to Major General Charles Frank Bolden, Jr., former administrator, NASA, USA, for delivering an inspiring presentation and also a fruitful interaction with our students. Thank you very much, sir. We would like to place on record our sincere thanks to the CETA for all, Judge Matthew and Sarah Grass from U.S. Consulate for coordinating, coordinating with us in planning and executing this program very fruitfully. Thank you very much. We express our deep sense of gratitude and the heartful thanks to our management for their unstinted support and encouragement extended in all our programs we organize in our institute. Thank you very much, sir. We place on record our sincere gratitude and heartful thanks to Dr. Karisi Dappa, Vice Chancellor, Vishwa Technological University, Belagam, and also the Registrar of Technical University for providing us permission and making suitable arrangements to telecast this program simultaneously on e-shikshana platform to reach the students of the technical institution across our state. We express our sincere thanks to the management and principals of BMS College of Engineering, RV College of Engineering, Nitya Minakshi Institute of Technology, 
BNM Institute of Technology and the Vice Chancellors of PS University and the Ramaya University of Applied Sciences for their help and cooperation extended to arrange the direct video conferencing with their inst institutions. We express our sincere thanks to B.S. Ram Prasad, Chief Executive, and G. Ram Chandra, Chief Finance Officer, for all the encouragement for us to organize this in a very meticulous way. Thank you very much, sir. We thank all the invitees and guests for having accepted our invitation and for their gracious presence in this program. We thank the media, print as well as visual, visual media for having accepted our invitation and have come here to cover this program. Thank you very much. We thank all the Sai Baba, the Aditya Systems for providing us all the technical support for conducting this program and telecast simultaneously for all the institutions. Thank you very much. And we thank all the HODs, the section heads, faculties and staff who have helped cooperated with us in organizing this program. So last but not the least, we thank all the students for the participation and have a fruitful interaction with the distinguished speaker. And we thank everyone for all the cooperation and help. Thank you one and all. I request all the students to be seated till the dignitaries leave the auditorium. I request all the audience to be seated. Okay, other colleges, other colleges, RIT staff to come to the video. RIT staff, RIT staff to come to video and take the microphone in all other colleges. So can we have the wall? All colleges, RIT staff, take the mic and face the video. Can you have it on the video wall, please, all the colleges? Yeah, uh, RIT faculty, please thank the, please thank the coordinators principals and administrators of your respective colleges. We thank you, sir, for your cooperation. Individually, all the RIT staff, please thank the individual coordinators, principal of the respective colleges. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you one and all. Refreshment is arranged just outside the venue. Kindly have a drink. Sir, NSS to do the to Mike Kodrapa. NSS of Rook, I'm going to read a mic. Then, only David to Diasatrabani. <laughs> <laughs> 